All right. All right, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name's Allison Korn. I am the Assistant Dean for Experiential Education at UCLA School of Law. And I am really happy to welcome you all to the first session in our Teaching Justice webinar series for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, today, our topic is Beyond the Carceral State, Critically Teaching Criminal Law and Criminal Procedure. We are joined by Amna Akbar from Ohio State University Moritz College of Law and Jocelyn Simonson from Brooklyn Law School. And um, we are just thrilled to have them present today and really kick us off to what um, will be an amazing lineup for uh, this year. Uh, this is actually our first session uh, that where um, during the pandemic, where we are all a little bit more um, functional when it comes to Zoom tools. So we want to encourage as much of an interactive um, session as possible. Uh, we want to let you know, and you've probably seen already, that this session is being recorded. It will later be available on the CLIA website with all of our archived uh, webinar presentations. We'll circulate that information and link after the session concludes. Uh, the presenters today, as I mentioned, encourage a lot of interaction using the chat function. And if you'd like right now, you can go ahead and um, put your name, what you teach, and if you bring any burning questions to the session today. Uh, also, if you have a question during the session or something occurs to you, please do use the chat function in real time. Uh, and the presenters will also make time during the presentation to answer questions using the video function. We do ask everyone during the presentation to please mute their microphones, but if you are comfortable, you're welcome to keep your video on during the session. Um, although she is unable to join us today, this series would not exist without my co-collaborator Layla Halas, who is the Director of Experiential Learning at Tulane and co-chair of CLIA's Best Practices and Pedagogy Committee. The Teaching Justice webinar series is a project of this committee, and this is our third year um, uh, implementing such a series. Um, it has featured a number of innovative faculty who discuss new approaches to teaching justice in the classroom, and each session has drawn on the wisdom of the current resistance movement and examines its intersections with criminal justice, immigration policy, racial justice, and economic justice, among other issues. As I mentioned, uh, including today, we have an excellent lineup for this academic year. Please stay tuned to the CLIA website as well as the clinic and Lextern listservs for more updates and information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jocelyn and Amna. Thank you both again for joining us today, and we look forward to the session. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, it's really nice to be here. We have a pretty straightforward plan for the next hour. And as much as we would love to do breakout groups and discussion, I think in an hour that might be hard. So like Allison said, we really think it's great if you wanna engage and we'll also invite engagement in the chat box. Um, and there might be some time for some people to turn on their cameras at some point as well. But what we thought we'd do is just spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit about our collaboration around these questions over the last several years. Then I'm going to give like kind of a 10 minute overview of the questions um, presented by the conventional way of teaching criminal law and Jocelyn is going to um, lead us through kind of like a moderated discussion with ideas about how to teach the class in a way that's more attuned to the violence of the carceral state and the way that communities resist it um, while inviting you to share how you do the same things in your classroom. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Um, one thing we wanted to mention is sort of just to introduce ourselves. Um, we both teach criminal law. I teach criminal procedure too. We both also teach classes about social movements and the law and Amna teaches a clinic as well. Um, and Amna and I um, have both sort of been in collaboration thinking about these questions for a number of years. Um, including writing the Guerrilla Guides to Law Teaching uh, four or five years ago. Um, and I mentioned that just to say that uh, we don't feel like we have the answers to any of these questions, but we have been uh, thinking about them together for quite a few years and feeling really challenged and frustrated by conventional ways of teaching these courses. And I would add, you know, also, you know, um, hopeful by the growing interest in 
the Legal Academy, um, as well as the country more broadly uh, in these questions that really force us to rethink some of the basic functioning and premises of the world that we live in. Um, and so, you know, more recently in the last few years, um, we initially pulled together this um, kind of grouping of faculty that cross kind of doctrinal and clinic divides and teach, um, you know, first year criminal law, criminal procedure, clinics, um, as well as seminars to kind of come together uh, in a larger group that's frustrated about um, just the general prosecutorial carceral orientation of the way we teach these courses across the curriculum and an understanding that to kind of um, rethink and redo how we teach these courses, it requires all of us to kind of struggle with um, these questions together. And so we've been really eager, um, you know, to try to support or facilitate or bring together people to kind of struggle with these questions together. So um, we really see this as an extension of that. Um, and if you want to kind of get plugged into that, um, you know, larger kind of pedagogy community around anti-carceral methods to teaching, um, any kind of course that's related uh, to criminal law. So if we have some immigration folks as well, please feel free to um, email us. Is there anything else we should say, Jocelyn, before I start? Let's jump in. Okay. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna share is actually a little bit of a modification of a talk I gave to students. And the reason why I'm sharing that that's where it started um, was because it occurred to me in preparing for this that, um, you know, it'd been some time since I kind of archived or tried to understand the problems with the mainframe for teaching a criminal law, criminal procedure uh, kind of course, which I think has some carryover, although I've done enough clinical work to understand that clinical courses are quite a bit different. Um, and so, um, and, uh, you know, increasingly, I'm sure you're finding this at your law schools as well, students are organizing to get the kind of information tools and an analysis that they need um, that they're not getting from the curriculum. Uh, and so, you know, I've been invited by students across the country to kind of help them think about what the problems are with the conventional way of teaching the course. And in doing that, I kind of generate, partly because it freed me from having to answer the questions or just to help, help them pose the questions, um, it allowed me to pose a more expansive set of questions and critiques than I had allowed myself in a sense. And so um, I'm not teaching criminal law this year. I'm hoping in the next year before I teach it again to kind of have some uh, opportunity to rethink the course. And so. Uh, I don't have answers for these big questions, but I think kind of sitting with the questions is a good place to start. Um, so um, the ordinary criminal law class goes something like this. It starts with talking about how the criminal law represents community norms and that we entrust the state to enforce those norms. We entrust police, prosecutors, and prisons to punish people for violating them. We won't talk that much about these institutions to create space to test these assumptions though. The ordinary criminal law class does not identify what community we are talking about or the possibility of many differently situated communities. It does not even ask what these norms are exactly or who decided what these norms are, how they were set and why, or what accounts for how they change over time, apart from you know that things change and communities have values. You get a selective slice of history. The history of British common law constitutes the fundamental roots of our tradition. But the ordinary criminal law course does not talk about the history of British colonialism, an empire so large the phrase was coined to encapsulate its vastness, the sun never sets on the British empire. Nor do we talk about how it was that British settlers arrived on Turtle Island and dispossessed indigenous people and enslaved and trafficked African people to work the land for hundreds of years. How that process created a new never ending territory, a wealthy and global superpower called the United States. That it is from within this history that criminal law and its institutions are built. We don't talk about the history of slave and border patrols or militias, the black codes or mass incarceration as a law and order backlash against the civil rights movement. We don't talk about capitalism and colonialism, enslavement and dispossession as the roots of our tradition. In addition to some history, you get some theory, the theories of punishment, retribution and utilitarianism. These theories are presented as setting out the normative bases for which we punish. When deciding whether to punish someone, we tell the students there are two questions. First, do they deserve it? We don't cover the terrain of what constitutes deservingness and how who deserves what is often a product of what people already have or what they take from others through the widespread norm of lawful exploitation. 
We don't discuss why questions of desert are limited to whether a particular person deserves to be thrown in a cage for a day or a year or a lifetime with only the most minimal outer limits of what kind of punishment is proper. We are told there's one other question, or we told, tell the students there's one other question. Is it socially useful to punish this person? What metrics are relevant is never explicitly defined, but it seems that all that matters is deterrence and incapacitation. We don't believe in rehabilitation anymore. It doesn't work. We aren't really sure whether deterrence works either, but we haven't really reconsidered incarceration. In fact, as a society, we've doubled down. A criminal is a criminal, and all we can do is lock them away. We don't ask too many questions about what locking away millions of people and subjecting millions more to probation and parole does to our communities, our social bonds, or our modes of governance. We don't give the students very many tools to ask if it's socially useful to incarcerate over 2.3 million people a year or subject twice as many to criminal supervision through probation and parole. We don't give them space to ask, when we say rehabilitation has failed, what are we talking about? And why is it that people, poor black and brown people, immigrants, disabled, queer and trans people, once they have contact with the criminal system end up there again and again? We don't discuss the costs of or implications of incarcerating millions of people, disproportionately poor and houseless, black and brown. We don't discuss alternatives. What if rather than criminalizing the houseless, we organized and demanded housing for all? Why do we have the crimes we do? Or why is it that some crimes like fare evasion or panhandling or theft from Walmart are prosecuted aggressively while baseline modes of exploitation are left in place? Why is it okay to possess billions of dollars but criminal to live or work on the streets? We do talk about substantive crimes in criminal law, typically homicide and rape after spending weeks on actus reus, mens rea, and causation, and maybe some time on plea bargaining. If we teach plea bargaining, we tend to teach it as a transaction, as opposed to a fatally flawed process that does violence to millions of people every day, that draws from and contributes to extreme imbalances of power by suggesting that there's some process to the madness. Nor do we talk about prison much beyond a theoretical destination for breaking the law. What precisely is this punishment that people deserve? What is its violence and its deprivation? Once you decide they deserve it, it's essentially nothing, but I mean, it's, uh, sorry, once you've decided they deserve it, it's essentially anything, but we aren't going to talk about that either, apart from maybe a day on a few Eighth Amendment cases. Last year, when I taught McCleskey versus Kemp, I asked my students, when should the state be able to put someone to death? And one of my two black students in that class raised their hand and said, Professor, do you mean through the formal legal process via the death penalty, or do you mean to include the police? And of course, we don't talk much about the violence of police either, or that their guns and cuffs are focused on poor black and brown people. The ordinary criminal law class provides then an idealized and abstracted landscape from which to understand particular cases applying doctrine. We focus on individual cases about individual defendants and the propriety of a particular result, which sometimes turns on a technical issue, but often turns on something real and urgent that's hollowed out in the court's analysis and the case book's limited purview about what's going on and the scope of the inquiry. So we don't talk scale and we don't talk resources. Why do we incarcerate so many people, more people than any other country in the world? Why do we invest more resources in policing than in jobs, education, housing, and healthcare in the way that today's movements are so urgently arguing? We don't talk about the ideology of the criminal law, that it designates the criminal as the outsider, someone who has violated our norms for some unexplainable set of reasons that we don't care to investigate with much time. But you start to get the sense that criminals are just bad people in the course. There's no understanding them, so why should we try? We get distracted from how we are all complicated, that each of us harms other people or participates in harming others in different ways. And so in the course, poverty becomes the fault of the individual stealing from the Walmart or jumping the turnstile rather than the political, economic, and social order that doesn't guarantee food and transportation. Insufficient affordable housing is displaced onto the unhoused person living in an encampment rather than that order that doesn't guarantee housing. And of course, the fact is that lawyers are at the center of all of this. Prosecutors and public defenders, legislators at the local, state, and federal level, judges, mayors, governors, and presidents. We also don't talk about that. 
and we don't talk about alternatives. How else might we respond to po poverty and high rates of violence in our society? And you might think, well, these aren't questions for the criminal law. But given we send 10 million people to jail every year and we have hundreds of thousands of police and we spend billions of dollars on these institutions, we know that jails and police and criminal law are a primary mode of governing the country. So if we stay focused on what presents, what self presents as a criminal law question without exploring alternatives, we will be locked into seeing all sorts of social problems from houselessness to gender-based and patriarchal violence to theft and mental illness as crimes we will never see the alternatives. We will not appreciate these very social problems and the frequency with which they appear for what they point out about our collective failures and our collective work ahead. So I will stop there. And um, actually we'll just invite, cause there hasn't been much going on in the chat so far, like any kinds of thoughts, reactions, disagreements, anything at all. Um, if anyone wants to put that in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself and share that way, that's also fine. We also still want to invite people to put into the chat a hello and let us know what classes you teach um, because it'll be helpful in sort of thinking we're gonna shift into talking more concretely about strategies. But yeah, we welcome reactions or questions um, to Amna's opening. I mean, I suppose if people don't have reactions now, we can also come back to this at the end. Um, but let's just wait one more minute and then we'll go to the next thing. Yeah, and as we wait, I guess I'll just say that when we um, go to talking about strategies, um, I'm gonna talk about some strategies, but we really are hoping that people will tell us some of their own strategies too in the chat or elsewhere. So. All right, do you want to take it away, Jocelyn? Yeah, let me do that. Okay, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. So um, when we talk about anti-carceral teaching, um, what we thought we'd do is uh, put up a few sort of guiding principles that um, we both think about when we're teaching any of our courses. We're thinking now about criminal law, but also criminal procedure. And really um, the strategies we're about to talk about, um, I designed to be sort of a set of tools that actually could go to any course in law school. Uh, but in general, um, we're thinking about um, teaching about how the law interacts with race, class, gender, gender identity, disability, immigration status, and difference. That being a central way that we're introducing each text we engage in. Uh, teaching abolition, uh, it's just two words on here, uh, but this is really central to how both of us go about teaching. Um, I included, if we're thinking about criminal law in class one and class two as readings uh, that we read along with more traditional theories of why we should have um, the carceral state. <clears throat> Engaging with social movement ideation, um, this is something we both try to do uh, day in and day out in our classes. So thinking not just about critique, uh, but also on the right, hope is a discipline is a phrase coined by Mariam Kaba that's been uh, put into a lot of different forms of art. Um, and these ideas, some of the biggest hope that we see comes from uh, the kinds of ideas that social movements are giving to us. To study history, so not just think as law, something that's handed to us, but something that's been created. And because it's been created, it's also therefore contingent and changeable. And then leaving space for discussion, for reflection, for frustration, and then also for hope. Um, I don't know about others, but I find that teaching remotely, this is especially hard because things go more slowly. And there's actually more discussion in my classes than there has been in previous years. So I've been trimming my syllabus left and right to try to just leave this space um, that feels more important than covering all the material. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through um, 12 different strategies. And what uh, these are ideas that hopefully could be translated into any, any one class, uh, including beyond criminal law. And a couple of them are gonna be crim pro suggestions. 
But what we would love to do, again, the idea is not that we've figured out the best 12 strategies for doing this, but these are 12 things um, that uh, we've been trying out and working through in different ways. And what uh, we would really love, um, I see there's some chat, um, but for each of these strategies, if other people find that they do them and have a way or an example of how they do them, um, that could be really helpful. So the first thing is acknowledging what's missing. It sort of goes to how no one syllabus is gonna capture the intricacies and the tentacles of the carceral state um, and how uh, wide it ranges, um, how it gets into not just people who are sitting in cages and prisons, but also to their families and to their communities and different kinds of carceral control. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have to teach every single moment of it, um, but one thing that I try to do is acknowledge what's missing and name it and invite students to come talk to me about it elsewhere. To give one example, just have a picture on each slide with one example. When I teach criminal law, I don't um, spend time talking about uh, the so-called insanity defense. Um, and I don't spend as much time as I'd like to talking about the ways that people are detained uh, because of disability, especially because of mental disabilities. Um, and sometimes that uh, detaining is happening through civil law rather than through criminal law. And so I try to acknowledge that and talk about for about, really it's two minutes, talk about the number of people who are involuntarily committed in different ways um, and name that we're not gonna get there in our class, but that it's important and name some of the intersectional ways, name which disabled people, right? Of what identities um, are subject to this. Um, so again, if there are other things that people don't teach that they try to throw in there, um, we'd love to hear about it. Um, another thing I try to do is acknowledge our own experiences. And I do that not because my own experiences are that fascinating, um, but because I want my students to share their own experiences and their own identities too. Um, and to acknowledge that who we are and where we come from affects how we experience the world, how we experience uh, the law and policing. Um, but also affects how we read and interpret the things that we're learning about. Um, so uh, because I'm often teaching in New York City, um, transportation in various ways is a, tries to be a theme throughout my course, uh, whether it's uh, the ideas of jaywalking, uh, bicycle speeding through red lights, um, or jumping turnstiles and taking transportation without paying. These are all things that uh, can be subject to jail time in New York City in various ways. Um, things that I've done plenty of times, but never have myself been uh, arrested or subjected to jail time. So I usually tell stories of being a teenager and various ways that I broke the criminal law um, and sort of asking my students to think about why um, as a white person on the Upper West Side, I wouldn't have been subject to policing. <clears throat> so if other people do that in different ways, be useful to hear about it. Another thing I try to do is contextualize cases with stories um, and stories in a couple of different ways. Um, the example I give is in teaching the city of Chicago versus Morales case. Um, this is a case uh, a challenge, successfully challenging a loitering statute um, aimed at uh, quote gang violence in Chicago in the 1990s. And uh, the book that I use as an excerpt from Morales that doesn't mention Mr. Morales. Uh, and so I assign a supplementary reading from Dorothy Roberts article uh, about this case, uh, really terrific article. I just assigned two quick pages from it. Um, and in that excerpt, she tells two different sets of stories. One is about Mr. Morales himself. It turns out he was a Latinx teenager uh, wearing a blue hoodie. Um, and so those facts, right, about the clothing, um, about his identity, and he was also in a white neighborhood. Um, which is probably part of what led, not probably, part of what led to uh, his being stopped and subject to the statute. And the second is that Dorothy Roberts uh, says, we also have to think about the history of policing. And so she names slave patrols and she names uh, police torture and she names different po racialized policing histories in Chicago um, to remind us that this didn't come out of nowhere. Contextualizing cases with history. So it's related to the previous one. Um, but I think many of us, at least in our textbook, have this case, excuse me, have this case Williams, 
uh, which is supposed to be a case teaching us about negligent homicide. Um, it is actually a really heartbreaking story um, about two uh, Native American parents whose child dies because they're afraid to seek out medical help because they're worried that their child will be taken away from them by child welfare agencies. Uh, it came before the passage of ICWA. And my book, I use Kadish, but um, the critiques I make of books, I, I, I think um, are pretty, pretty much go to most criminal law textbooks out there. Happy to hear about exceptions. Um, <clears throat> I think perhaps um, the Lee and Harris textbook, which some people might use, uh, does have some of these materials in it. So I assign students, um, I ask them to go and see what they can learn about the Indian Child Welfare Act. And then we come in and we report back to each other about the different findings that led to the passage of it. Um, and sort of putting into real historical terms, uh, the legitimacy of the fear that Williams and her co-parent would have felt. And then to contextualize cases with follow-up. Um, so uh, after teaching and learning about the Williams case, my textbook in a quick note implies that the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed and that the problem was fixed. Um, but I end uh, the unit on Williams by talking about uh, indigenous social movements uh, happening now that are protesting uh, child welfare and the carceral state and the ways that they are entangled so um, this picture here is from South Dakota in January of this year um, <clears throat> and uh, showing uh, these are uh, people uh, in a grassroots organization. Our children are not for sale um, and they're uh, frustrated with both adoption and state um, <clears throat> welfare policies. So showing sort of uh, putting into doubt uh, whether the law, uh, whether passing a federal law can really fix these problems. Um, and so again, I'm going to pause for a minute and encourage if people, whether or not it's these cases or these moments, uh, we would love to know if there are certain moments while teaching these courses that you all, because I'm sure you do, um, contextualize your cases with stories, with history, and with follow up since those cases that maybe um, especially for something like a, a six, uh, you know, a happy story in the textbook contextualized with how the carceral state um, continues to grow um, and entwine itself um, in the lives of marginal, in the lives of marginalized people. I, mean, I don't know if you see in the chat box, um, Justin. I'm not looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a comment or question. Um, from Christy Lopez that says interested in what people think about using we are all criminals, short video and readings to make point about our own experiences. I'm of mixed minds. Um, and then Gus Tupper says, I've been thinking a lot about how to discuss my own experiences with criminal law with students and the young people we work with who are directly impacted by the system and monetary sanctions most relevant to our work. How do you balance sharing your experience to create space for others while acknowledging a relative privilege? Those feel like interrelated questions. I don't know if you have any reflections on those. Yeah, well, I have in the past had my students each go watch two of those We Are All Criminals videos and then come back and, and report back on what they saw. Um, I don't mind them. I think they're a fine start. I'm just not necessarily sure I'd want them to be the end. I'd be curious to know, Christy, what your mixed mind is. Um, and then, oh, sorry, go, go for it. Oh, Not sorry. Um, yeah, I'm honestly, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but I think it was actually related to Gus's point that it felt, I mean, it is, it, they're in many ways brilliant, but in many ways it feels like a very particular perspective. Um, and I don't, um, I have felt sometimes it has gone really well and other times it sort of felt like it's not left space for other students to have a very different um, perspective. Um, and so I'm not sure whether there's a way to uh, ensure that it goes one direction more than the other, if that makes sense. I guess I'll share one reaction to that, which is I remember when I first started, I mean, so I started, you know, trying to teach in some form of anti-carceral way from the beginning. And that was part of how Jocelyn and I developed a close friendship because we taught the class for the first time 
the same time. And so we talked all the time. And, um, you know, like this has happened to me several years where like a particular activity doesn't go as I had hoped. Um, and obviously, and that goes also for just for teaching the course generally, but when you try something new, sometimes it doesn't work. And one of my insights now is that, um, you know, it's why it's really important to continue to return to the themes of the deep violence, contingency, partiality um, of the system again and again and again, and thinking about alternatives and other social, sorry, other solutions or responses to the same social problems. Um, because taking on the discourse and the architecture of criminalization in a first year criminal course or criminal law course, criminal procedure or a clinic is really, really, really hard. You're fighting a lot of what's happening in the curriculum. You're fighting the casebook. Um, you're fighting what they're learning about the world and the role of lawyers in it. Um, and so um, I think, uh, you know, like obviously I take it hard when an exercise doesn't go as planned, but I think the key is just to return and keep, you know, keep trying. Um, and so, because no one exercise, um, even if it goes perfectly, is gonna kind of convey, um, you know, uh, kind of plant the seed to fundamentally question the system if the student doesn't come in with that. Um, and for those students who come in with that, um, you, know, you know, it's my goal to kind of create an atmosphere where they can continue to sustain um, that questioning and try to find a role um, for themselves. Um, okay, there's a bunch more questions. I'll keep monitoring them, Jocelyn, but why don't you keep going since you still have a bunch more to get through. Great, keep them coming. I'm looking through them um, and they're really rich. I wanna think about all of them. Um, okay. Um, another thing to do is that, you know, because you're all uh, coming from the clinical teaching space, you of course know that hypotheticals and getting into role are the pedagogically a great way for us to internalize the doctrine that we're learning. Um, so one way to, you know, one challenge is to then use hypotheticals and problems that highlight social context and that highlight the violence of the carceral state in ways that don't necessarily come out in sort of a question about statutory interpretation. To give one quick example, <clears throat> my first uh, three, my first unit in criminal law is about legality. A lot of people start this way. That's after doing abolition and purposes of punishment. So we learn about vagueness, statutory interpretation, and the rule of lenity. Um, and we talk about proportionality. Um, and so then I try to, every few classes, have some kind of simulation. And the first, uh, or it's the second one, but the main one I do in this um, unit um, is to uh, do a situation where my students are either defending or prosecuting somebody who's been prosecuted under what in New York we call the walking while trans statute. Um, it's loitering for the purpose of engaging in prostitution. Um, and so coming into that class, I tell them to review the doctrine, but I have them read this report put together uh, by Make the Road New York, uh, which has a number of narratives of LGBTQ, uh, Latinx, uh, mostly uh, trans women, <clears throat> being um, profiled uh, for quote loitering for the purpose of engaging in prostitution in New York. And so I have them read uh, that, you know, written by um, lawyers who are engaging with social movements. I have them read that report and then we come in and the client they're either prosecuting or defending is a trans woman in Jackson Heights in Queens. Um, and I give them uh, then at the time some history from the seventies about the passage of this law and some history from the last few years of people both challenging and saying the law is really important, especially in this neighborhood in Queens. And then I ask them to apply it to the doctrine. And so pedagogically, they're still learning these constitutional rules and rules of statutory interpretation. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but they're doing it in a context and I do try to keep it in my local area. Um, and so when I taught, um, in Massachusetts last year, I changed up my hypos to try to make them local, but they don't have to be local um, using uh, hypotheticals that, that highlight different contexts. <clears throat> and then in terms of, again, we're all, I think we're all these, I, those of you who know, you're all amazing teachers. We're all you know doing hypotheticals and problems and things like that. But when we do that, um, remembering to assign roles that highlight contingency in other words, show us that things can be different 
and therefore give us hope. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the example I gave before wasn't quite one of those. Um, but another way we could think about it is that um, I have a number of times during the semester for criminal law, and I do this uh, in criminal procedure too, putting people in the local government thinking about policing, um, where I invite, I tell students that they're legislators and they have a number of choices. And I tell them not, should we pass this criminal law? Right, right? does it have vagueness problems, et cetera? But I say, here's the problem. So uh, in class this week, we, we were talking about the opioid epidemic, epidemic. I actually gave them a not New York state and gave them statistics um, about the opioid epidemic. And then I asked them how they wanted to solve the, that problem and gave them as one option, um, uh, passing a drug-induced homicide statute, which is what a lot of case, uh, places are doing. Um, and uh, they all, some of them also had ideas about giving prosecutors more money to run drug treatment programs, et cetera. Um, on the right is a poster that I used from my first class and I often just have it on the slide to remind them. It's from a critical resistance poster in the 1990s. Um, and uh, it's missing, sorry, the bottom line, which says abolish the prison industrial complex. And the idea here is that we have a, um, <clears throat> we don't have an infinite number of resources either in our minds or just um, the state's money uh, to solve social problems. But if we close that door to jail, then perhaps we can open up some of these other doors. And so, for example, they were legislators in the opioid ep epidemic. Uh, we actually went through every one of these doors um, and even libraries, um, my students were imagining how being able to be engaged with programming at libraries um, and having a safe space in libraries could be part of a broader solution to the opioid epidemic. So remembering that we don't have to pass these criminal law statutes. My book also has early on, one of the first problems is whether to pass a bullying statute like Massachusetts did in the aughts. And so there again, instead of asking should we have this statute? So this criminal law exists. Asking more broadly, what is this criminal law trying to get at? It doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, and acknowledging, first of all, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's a racialized or racist understanding of the world that says that to be to not have a house uh, is a problem. But maybe it is a problem. Maybe people are dying uh, from overdose. Maybe people are harming each other. Um, if we want to agree that the state should do something, what do we think they should do? Um, and so on the one hand, that's kind of a pretty resounding critique of criminal law, but I also, uh, it does give some hope um, for there being other ways to go about uh, thinking about these problems. So again, I really welcome people. If you have hypos you use, uh, tell us about them. Or other ways of highlighting contingency, the main one I think about is just putting students in like higher levels of government that go beyond the carceral state that get outside of the silos. So instead of the police chief in CrimPro, I have people be the mayor to decide how to get at the problem of disorder or what it might be. Just to build on but that a little, one thing I tried last time that was really fun and did what I hoped it would, which was when we did some kind of activity and I can't remember what it was, but it was one of those activities where you put people in role. And I think normally it's like, you know, the process office the police like maybe even the mayor and then you do like group like I think people often do things like the public defender or the ACLU but I added things in the mix like the local Black Lives Matter chapter and the Democratic Socialists of America and our students you know like given when they're coming up and everything that's happening in the world they had and I assigned them randomly they had no like trouble kind of figuring out what BLM or what DSA how they would respond to the local statute it was around a case that was about criminalizing homelessness and that led to a really good discussion. So I think when we do um, the hypos, there's a way to highlight the broad range of um, people who are impacted, but also broad range of points of view that are being debated in the country right now and ways of thinking of social problems in a way that also advances the decarceral agenda. Yeah, that's really helpful. And even thinking about when I do put students in role as prosecutor and defense attorney, in the debrief, not just asking how it went, but just sort of asking, was anyone frustrated that this situation ended up in criminal court? Um, some, you know, or we could ask, uh, oh, it turn imagine that you're from Black Lives Matter. What do you think you think about this prosecution? Um, getting out into the world and bringing the world in. Um, <clears throat> 
This is another way to think about context and to get outside our own experiences. Um, in regular times, I have my students court watch, go sit in court and watch what's happening. We talk about beforehand why that might be uncomfortable, um, why it might seem like voyeurism and I invite students are uncomfortable not to do it. But if they are comfortable, my students are often astounded and I forget that it's astounding. Um, they go sit in Brooklyn criminal court and they watch 100% people, poor people of color uh, coming in front of the judge in arraignments, mostly for low level crimes still. And we live in a progressive prosecution jurisdiction. Um, and they come back devastated and sometimes in tears. And so it's worth also talking about them about that possibility. Um, but I find that it's also worth it. So I have them reflect on the arraignments and then we talk about it in class. Not useful to do unless we're giving the space to process it. I think some people have their students go to jails or prisons. Um, I imagine that that presents equal or greater possibilities of trauma and voyeurism. I don't do it um, for some of those reasons, but I do talk about it and tell them ways if they're interested to think about um, getting into jails and prisons as an advocate. Um, <clears throat> but it's not always possible um, or people aren't always comfortable getting out into the world. It's also possible to bring the world in. This is just a clip from a Brooklyn Community Bail Fund video that I always show when we're talking about plea bargaining um, because I've watched it so, so many times. I'm like, I know this family. Um, but uh, this is a man named Miguel who pleads guilty because bail has been set in the amount he can't afford. It's kind of a basic thing to say, but if you show a two minute video about it, it comes to life. And I think we know this, but um, sometimes it, it, I think it's worth remembering that even just adding a two minute video can help contextualize what's happening. This year, uh, my colleague, uh, Kate Mogulescu from Brooklyn Law School and I uh, tried to put together a couple of long form conversation. So she and I each had an hour long um, <clears throat> conversation, uh, you know, just the two of us on Zoom. So mine was with Robert Salim Holbrook, who's the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center, a, a profound expert on lots of different subjects. So we talked for an hour and then I broke it up into six different chapters that can be used in various part times across the curriculum. Um, so when it's time to talk about what it means to be in prison, he talks about being in solitary confinement for uh, about 10 years. Um, and so I talk about that segment. When we talk about policing, he talks about the cool police reform work he's doing now that he runs the Abolitionist Law Center. Um, <clears throat> and so there are ways also to just uh, record asynchronous conversations and have them come in. And then of course, now we have the ability to bring people in on Zoom, uh, which it does feel like in some ways has opened up the world. And I don't think that will go away. Right, we can, it turns out I can zoom in a guest speaker, um, even if some people are there in person. So again, really welcome in the chat if there are other ways that people either get out into the world or bring the world in. I think some people for CrimPro do ride-alongs. It's another possibility. Um, again, not in my comfort zone, but uh, we're all in our, in our own comfort zones. So another thing, and this gets at, um, Amna's uh, um, example about putting people in role of being in the movement for black lives. Um, I also regularly either assign or just put up and ask people to react to um, social movement reactions to various laws. Um, so uh, whether it's locally or nationally, whatever you're studying, you can usually find, especially in the last five or six years with this amazing resurgence of activity and funding and artists who are engaging in really proud, profound critiques of the carceral state, you could probably find a report or at least an image that gives a different concept um, and a contrast to what you're studying. Um, so up here with the vision for black lives, which I in general have my students read um, in criminal law, including the more updated version uh, or in criminal procedure adjudication. When I study bail, I actually start out by having them go through the bail curriculum that Law for Black Lives put together. It's meant, I think, for high school age or maybe college age um, students to just start. Uh, it's like there's a bingo where you get to do um, different ways of thinking about the history of, uh, it starts with uh, slavery um, all the way up to ways that black people and poor people have been put in cages because of their race and because of their class. 
And only after that do we read United States versus Salerno and start to think about the constitutional law. So sometimes it means not just putting it as a footnote at the end, but leading with it sort of like, what if we start by thinking about how social, how social movements think about the law? And then after that, we study the doctrine that we need to learn or we think we need to learn. Uh, teach the small stuff. Um, so in criminal law, this means misdemeanors and even just tickets that can land you um, inside uh, the carceral state, uh, including in jail. Um, again, in New York City, jaywalking is an easy example. If I'm li live or even, you know, you can say how many people jaywalked on their way to school today and you get half the room. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my students often, if I ask them, uh, raise your hand if you think somebody in New York City was arrested for jaywalking today, usually uh, most people don't think that's happened. Um, and of course, it's not true, it's always happening. And so then I put up maps and slides showing um, that in uh, communities of color, um, quite literally, that's how you can figure it out by looking at the percentage of black and brown people who live in a neighborhood, whether people are ticketed for jaywalking. Um, so as, as much as I've been talking about teaching against the book, I also try to teach with the book. Um, so one example, this is a crim pro example. Um, I teach Utah v. Streif, I think a lot of us do now. Um, and at the end of that opinion, Sotomayor has her solo part of the dissent, which is in most textbooks, um, although without its footnotes. And it turns out that in her footnotes, she actually cites some pretty exciting sources. Uh, W.B. Du Bois, James Baldwin, Tani Hesey Coates, The New Jim Crow, The Miner's Canary, and there are more. And so when I teach Crim Pro, I spend an entire class called The Streif Descent Annotated. I take each of these sources, I pull out a couple of chapters, I split the students into groups, I have them read those chapters, and then I have them come back, tell us about them, and answer the question, why did Justice Sotomayor cite to this book? Um, <clears throat> we spend a whole class on it. Um, and I do have to give them a new version of Streif that shows those citations. Um, but that can be more effective than me coming in and saying, we're gonna read W.B. Du Bois. My students will, might push back on that. But instead it's like, no, it's in the Supreme Court case. And so we're gonna read it. So use the book and then teach against the book as well. Um, so I regularly try to assign, sometimes they're optional. Sometimes I'll just put them up on slides but sometimes they'll be part of the reading. Reports from community-based organizations um, or social movement configurations. Um, again, this is happening more and more, whether it's because of the internet or funding for grassroots organization or just the swell of energy and critique being generated from below. There are actually lots of reports that don't look as fancy as, um, you know, big funders reports or state reports, um, <clears throat> but instead, uh, so the examples I have up here are recent ones from Texas and one from a few years ago. Um, in Chicago reporting on policing in their local communities. So these would be things that like, you can't connect directly to a case, but are still squarely, we wanna say, in what we should be studying and thinking about. So those are the 12 examples I have. Um, people are putting things in the chat, which I really appreciate. Um, but we don't mean to say that these are the only 12 ways to go about it, as much as sort of suggesting that um, I, like Amna, want to just totally rethink criminal law. Um, but once again this year, I didn't do it. Um, the pandemic happened, it felt really hard. And so I'm still using an old and expensive um, case book, um, but I try to teach with it and teach against it. And I do sort of sometimes pull up my own slideshow for myself uh, to try to think of like, this class doesn't feel right. Um, what can I be doing differently? All right, well, we just have, thanks, Jocelyn. That was like so great and um, really helpful and concrete. And hopefully it, um, you know, generated ideas for folks and also helped them think about stuff that they're already doing. Um, in the meantime, I did hear from Valina Beatty, who um, is in the anti-carceral group with us that she's she can add people to the list if they wanna join. So if you wanna join, um, that listserv and that community, which meets more or less frequency, depend frequently depending on group interest and energy, um, you should email her. Um, something is stuck in my throat, so I'm going to hand it back to you for a second. 
<laughs> Great. So, and just, you know, some things we've done in that group in the past is break into small cohorts around a particular class we're teaching um, or have larger discussions like how to teach with podcasts or um, um, something like that. Um, so uh, I had a question about what Massachusetts hypos I use. Um, I use bullying. Um, I'm happy to send along. Um, while I was teaching there, there was an issue about uh, fair, uh, in New York, we call it transit justice. I think it was fair justice in Boston and the cost of taking the tea. Um, and so we talked about, uh, again, sort of from square one, thinking about poverty and transportation. How do we want to approach it? Was one example I used. I'll have to go think of the others. Um, and Christy, I'd be happy to share the Sotomayor stuff. Yeah, I mean, the other thing we've tried to do in the group is just try to, you know, great shared resources um, and uh, you know I would it'd be interested to hear from all the clinical folks like where and I mean I know we just have five minutes but if anyone wants to say a word or I don't know Allison are we supposed to end right now or do we have till two or do we have five more minutes definitely have five more minutes if okay. folks want to stay on I think we have through you know past 11 so please go for it Okay, I just wanted to ask you from the clinical folks, where and how is the state of these conversations around teaching and thinking about decarceration and abolition? Um, because, uh, you know, like that, the group that Jocelyn and I are talking about comes out of CrimFest. And I know that some uh, clinic people come to that, but not that many. And it's been some years since I've been to the, uh, the clinical conference in the spring. And so just curious, like, I mean, my general experience as being someone who's kind of gravitated across that line in different directions, different years is like, you know, the clinical conversation is usually more critical um, and advanced than uh, where the doctrinal teaching is. But just curious with this stuff, how, you know, like where the conversations are happening. Um, if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd be eager to hear. I'm also eager to hear you know, these are kind of small strategies. I'm eager to hear if people in their schools are rethinking more broadly about how we teach 1Ls and then how we teach across the curriculum about uh, what's often called criminal law, but also could be seeing more broadly um, the existence of the carceral state, the work of the law in the carceral state, and also the complicity of the legal academy in creating it. Um, I try to name that in my class, but this year I forgot to until the middle. And so one day I just came in and started telling my students about my own complicity in the carceral state. And they were all like, okay. Um, but it still felt important. I'm gonna stop my share. So Madeline is saying it's a challenge at my school. It's why I'm teaching the abolition class in the undergrad honors college. Um, yeah, it's all really helpful. I mean, I, I know people are like zoomed out and may not want to keep talking. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's all to say like, and Justin, if you want to answer this question, I'll hand it to you. But I guess the last comment I'll share is just, um, you know, it's, like any other of these major challenges, of like rethinking the architecture of our lives and the way that the legal system is um, complicit with it, it really requires, you know, a lot of struggling together with people inside and outside of law schools about how to do it. Um, and so we really invite you to like stay in touch, join the listserv, like, you know, join or support your local movement formations. Like these conversations need to be, need to and are happening. Um, inside and outside of law schools and the more of us who are kind of engaged and listening um, to uh, you know these really central and important uh, charges to the criminal system is really important to try to figure out how to integrate it because even since I started teaching abolition four or five years ago in my criminal law class like you know um, more and more of my, of my students come ready day one wanting to talk about it we've seen like a huge shift in how um, people are thinking and talking about this. And my guess is that you all are seeing that this fall as well. Yeah, so I just wanna answer the question about acknowledging my um, academic and then my own complicity in the carceral state. I try to do both. Um, I was a public defender for five years. And so I 
my students always want to know why I left. Um, and it's actually not a story about needing to leave, but I do uh, talk about all the wonderful stuff about doing it. And there was a lot of it. Um, and then I talked about the frustra I talk about the frustration of being part of the system um, and say that for anyone who's frustrated uh, with the system and the carceral state working within it is really rewarding. Um, and also something we have to really remain self-critical about and think about our own role in it. Um, I talk about that certainly uh, in thinking about prosecutors as well. My 1Ls this week wanted to know what I thought about progressive prosecutors. So we actually talked about it for quite some time. Um, but ac academia more broadly, uh, what I found I did this year in the middle of both my classes and teaching a seminar on how social abolitionist social movements are contesting the carceral state. And then I teach a 1L criminal law seminar is stopping for a minute, um, inspired by um, my colleague Alice Ristroff's article that's coming out about academic complicity in the carceral state. Um, so just sort of name that here we were just uh, studying the criminal law day in and day out and how doing that uh, might solidify for us um, its primacy um, and existence but also how much resources we were spending. I asked them to think about the tuition dollars that go to studying criminal law. And uh, I sort of named, Brooklyn Law School sent, makes a lot of people prosecutors. And so I sort of named that if you look across the street in the Brooklyn Criminal Courthouse, uh, our law school has a place in its creation. So I just sort of name it. Um, uh, and I mean to, I try to just, whenever I do this stuff, I try to just implicate myself in it as well so that it's not just saying everyone else is to blame. And then I try to name some ways that I'm trying to push back against it. Um, Miriam, I'd love to know um, what you do or if you have thoughts. Sorry, it took me a second to get off mute. Um, I don't, I haven't done that yet, but I've heard um, other colleagues mention that that um, they do it and I just have never really had a sense of the nuts and bolts but the link that Amna sent looks like it's gonna be really helpful as was your answer so I appreciate it and it's something I'll consider um, in future classes for sure. Oh did Nicole's piece come out? That's great yeah Nicole Smith has an awesome piece and I think maybe it's not already. actually out yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm not totally sure. It's but not out yet. If it's not out yet, yeah. it's totally coming soon. Um, and it's really great. Yeah. And it is on SSRN, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, Allison and Layla, who's not here, thank you so much for convening us. And like, this is also, you know, like a really important labor for the community and for raising these questions and really appreciate the leadership role that you're both playing to create the space and, um, you know, create these conversations. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, this was a terrific presentation. And while I am no longer engaged specifically with criminal law, I think you, you gave me a lot of good ideas and galvanized me to think about these really critical issues. And in fact, our next session on November 18th will be about teaching critical lawyering. We're gonna be joined by our colleagues at University of Miami uh, Law School and um, please stay tuned. We will be updating all of the listservs and CLIA website shortly with that information. Um, but again, to Amna and Jocelyn, thank you so much. Uh, really fantastic, especially this week and this year, which feels so hard. It, it gives me a lot of hope to hear about what you're teaching and how we can all take um, lessons from, from what you're doing and how you're thinking about it. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. And, um, and we will see you next time, November 18th. Everyone have a, a good weekend and, and best wishes for a continued positive semester. <laughs>